Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, wow, you know, Carl just said, Melody is a tough act to follow. That's a, that's a great presentation. And uh, um, I first want to begin with uh, thanking the IHF to ask me to uh, come here, be the presenter, and uh, wrap up this, uh, these great two days of presentations with a ton of information, um, really inspiring stuff. And I think uh, if you, uh, you've been here for both days, starting with Tom's address right away, um, hockey's role in society and uh, um, how we, the, the uh, symposium was built up from there through player development and um, uh, leadership aspects and um, you know basically every aspect of hockey that affects coaching and management you know pretty impressive stuff um, a little bit about how I came um, to stand on the stage here especially with this uh, with this uh, subject um, uh, when uh, Stefan Scheidnagel came up to me about a month ago, uh, he said to me, we're still um, hanging in the playoffs there, and he said, hey, we got the symposium, why don't you come on stage and, uh, you know, why don't you do, do a quick presentation? And um, uh, I, I said, uh, you know, yeah, you know, you just let me know if it's, if it's power play or if it's penalty killing, D-zone coverage, you know, face-offs, whatever it is. He said, no, no, I won't be like that, just I'll keep you posted, you know, just do your finish the season. And... Uh, so the um, season is over, and uh, we, he comes to Berlin, and he meets with me, and he says, and I'm going back to, you know, normal stuff, stuff that I've done before that's in my comfort zone. Um, you know, why don't you talk about, uh, you know, I go, why don't I talk about face-offs, neutral zone, something? And he goes, X's and O's, and he goes, no, 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 I, I want you to talk about people, right? We don't, we don't want that from you. We want you to talk about people. I said, well, hold on, you know, do you know that what we're doing is, yeah, we're working with people about my thing is, you know, I, we, as coaches, we've got to find solutions. We, we work with, uh, with the tactical, the system, all those aspects. He said, no, no, I'm not interesting to these guys. I want you to talk about people. And uh, so he said, uh, tell me something about your career. So I ended up talking about my career. He goes, totally extrinsical. I go, I'm, I am what? He said, oh, extrinsically motivated. I said, okay. And uh, I said, so uh, what does that mean? Well, he said, I'll tell you something about my career. So Stefan starts talking about his career, and he goes, you see a difference? I go, yeah, pretty different. He goes, intrinsically. So I want you to talk about that. So first of all, those two words didn't mean much for me. Um, so over the next couple of weeks, I started with Google, I went to a couple of libraries, um, and uh, talked to a few people, and uh, got myself familiar with a, a motivational concept of uh, personalities. And uh, basic personalities break down without making it too complicated. But what drives a person? What's the driving behavior behind these players? We're looking for leaders. We're looking for good pros. We're looking for guys to be in our teams that, you know, that drag that card or the shit when we're in it and uh, that say the right things in the locker room when we're not in. Um, which brings me to the next uh, great sentence. I've heard this just recently in the playoffs. Um, Ken Hitchcock once said that uh, it doesn't matter what I say, what they say when I'm in the room. What matters is how what they say when I walked, have walked out of the room. And so, who are these people that are going to do the talking when the coaches turn their backs, when the coaches leave the locker room, and um, you know the guys that that we need. Um, so first, before I get into some stories or anecdotes, uh, you know, want to go back to those two motivational, um, behavior-driven um, ideas. Two sources of motiva motivation, basic. It's intrinsic versus extrinsic. Go to the next one there, because it explains it. The intrinsically motivated player, right? This is kind of the gold standard, what we're looking for in our guys. Right? Again, fairly new to me. Um, if you are a sports uh, psychologist, you've been familiar with this. If you've gone to university, studied this, you've, this is probably very basic for you. But for me, it was interesting. Um, and the intrinsically motivated player um, is the guy that we hopefully arrive at when we are working with young players. And everything that we've done, we've heard today is basically a step to get a player to mature into this kind of thinker. So behavior is defined by strong internal reward system. I think um, what, what, it's, what it says in, in simple terms is the guy gets a kick, he gets a rise out of doing something. There's not really anything. He doesn't get paid for it. He doesn't need praise for it. He doesn't need a pat on the back. What he does, he does it because 
For him personally, who he is, he thinks is the greatest thing that he could ever spend his time on. Um, he's an independent thinker who self-evaluates and analyzes. That is self-explanatory. And he defines his own value and reward system to create positive emotions. Well, obviously, we know that hockey is an emotional game. We're in it. And, uh, you know, without emotions, there's no energy. You play hockey without emotions. I mean, you might as well pack it up. You're not going to win a game, and you're not going to be a very good player. So it's a very important aspect of the intrinsically motivated player. And... He's fully invested, best case scenario. So imagine you have this kind of guy. If you're looking at this, at this screen and you th put this together, put a person together there and then think of him not being on board. He's not sitting in the boat. He's kind of watching. He's not really in it. He's checking. He could be a nightmare. This guy is a nightmare personality to coach. The other guy, the other per basic personalities that we are, end up uh, working with is the extrinsically motivated player. His behavior is defined by external rewards or to avoid punishment. Very simple concept. Anybody that's grown up in my, in my uh, um, era of hockey you know, is familiar with reward and punishment, is familiar with coaches coming down on a player when he's not doing what he's supposed to do, is, is familiar with a player being sent down in, North, in the North American system, is familiar with just you know, a negative experience that the player is going to experience when he's, when he's uh, off his game or you know, for, for whatever reason not, not doing what he's supposed to be doing. Probably very coachable. I put this in. Obviously, this is not on Google. Sees the coach as an enabler and best case scenario. So if I'm this guy, and I think at some point, uh, at some po uh, phases and times in my career as a player, I was definitely an extrinsically motivated player. I was living for that pat on the back, waiting for the kick in the ass that's only this far away from each other. It's a, it's a very fine line. You go through highs and lows, and you're looking for a reward. You take this further, guys get paid, guys want to earn money, so you are extrinsically motivated. It's not so necessary that you are working on yourself. You want to do whatever you need to do to get praise, reward, money, whatever it is, um, recognition, whatever it is to, uh, to, to perform and to be, feel like you're a success. Mentally often fragile, potential to close off or being defensive. So obviously you're in a bit of a roller coaster. Compare this guy that's extrinsically motivated, that's looking for the reward, with the guy that's is doing it for his own kick. He's self-motivated. He's not worried about money right now, a reward. He looks at the coach sort of as, yes, he's the leader, he gives him something, but he's self-driven. You know, those two guys are very different, and I find, out of my own experience, when I was in this phase of my career as a player, I went through huge highs and lows. Early on, I went 1986, I went to Buffalo as a young German player, thought I was going to rule the world, and found out very, very quickly that I'm not even close to having a spot in the world of, of, of North American hockey. So I, uh, you know, I would go try to do exactly what the coach wants me to do, a soldier mentality. He said, I do not want you to carry the puck. I do not want you to carry the pa pass the puck in the middle. I want you to put that puck to the winger or behind him off the glass in the neutral zone. You hit the red line, that puck goes deep. No ifs and buts. Krupper, you're going to win your battles. And if somebody even gets close to your, to your goaltender, you take your glove and you bang, you hammer him. All right. So that is what I'm supposed to do. And what if I don't do it? Well, then I'm going to be in the next plane back to Germany. So obviously, I had to kind of pull up my panties and go and figure out, you know, who I want to be and whether I want to do this. So, you know, I ended up playing or staying over there for 17 years, and it was the right decision. Really, really difficult for me to play in this in, in, uh, um, environment and to learn to make this mine and to be successful in this. Um, the coach's challenge for us, so we got these two player types. We're going to have the one guy that's, you know, he's the leader. He's already, he's mature. You know, he could be mature when he's 21 years old. I've seen Gabriel Landisco play in the Ontario Hockey League. I was working with Belleville at the time as an assistant coach there. And I've seen interviews of a, of a Swedish guy, a young Swedish player that's left Europe, gone to the OHL, and he has uh, given interviews and game analysis. He sounded like he was 
you know, a 35-year-old NHL veteran who's won three Stanley Cups. Amazing personality, amazing maturity in this guy. So was he intrinsically motivated? I would say if it's not black and white, he was very intrinsically motivated. If not entirely, because these guys have goals and they look for rewards, this guy was self-driven, very mature, and a very, very far for his age. Um, the challenges that we have as coaches with both personalities is that we got to figure out which one is what. Which one is what. You have the guy sitting in front of you that, you know, is just starting, to, is at the beginning of his career. He's looking for you to tell him what to do. Versus the guy that, like a Landis Coke, is already three steps ahead. He's ahead. He knows what to do. He's listened. He's been well coached. And, you know, he's just waiting his time to go on and get to the next level. Um, we got to make sure that we listen to these guys as coaches, that we end up looking for that, uh, that interview, that one-on-one, -on -one, the, the moment. I think we've heard it multiple times today where it says it was one minute. The one the presenter said it was one minute. The other guy said, take the time to find the time to get to know the guy. Right. Make the time to get to know your players and figure out what he is. Is this guy a mature, self-driven player? Or is he a guy that, you know, is kind of waiting for you for input? Is he, you know, kind of fragile? Is he not, not so sure of himself? Um, again, the gold standard, I said, is this uh, is a self-driven player. Somehow, in all of our jobs that we have as pro coaches, um, we got to figure out a way to inspire this guy that is extrinsically motivated, the guy, the fragile guy that's looking for you. Obviously, he has something. He wouldn't be there if he doesn't have something. So he has something. So we got to figure out how to get this guy to get on his feet so he can start running. And we got to, and I've heard this a lot this, uh, this weekend, uh, starting with Tom and Don Granado, working with young players. As coaches, we have to figure out a way to inspire the growth of the player personalities despite a pressure environment. That doesn't need any more explanation. We need to win games. We got to win points. We don't have a four-year program that we're going to run. Pro coaches at a high level, um, you, you're going to have to win or you're not going to keep your job. And as Alpo says, we're the ones that are gonna, the weakest link in the chain and we're going to lose our jobs. Um, there's some ways to go. Once you recognize it and you're working with your guys in training camp or you know, after a month or two in the season, you're going, there's, there's ways to promote this, this trans, transformation, this development. So you have this guy that's just a little insecure, he's nervous, but you go, he's got something. He's got something, and if I go and spend time with him, I can form him into a little bit more of a player. I can take him possibly into a guy that's eventually to be one of my leaders in the team. So I turn my back, he's going to say the right things, the things that we want, to, want, to, uh, want a good pro to, to, to say. And um, one example that's been brought up is the Most Improved Player Award or the Unsung Hero Award. Well, what does that do? For you guys that, you know, maybe not from North America and a little unfamiliar with it, the most improved player is obvious. It's, um, you know, the guy that has the biggest improvement in his game. He's, he's coming around. He's developing into a good player. The unsung hero is the guy that does things within the team that doesn't get a lot of recognition. It's not the guy that's going to be um, on the front pages. It's a, it's a guy that does a lot of work in the team, um, blocking shots, um, you know, doing a lot of the, the grunt work that we need in order to win hockey games. And both of those awards, kind of interesting, while I was reading my way into this and trying to familiarize with, this, with this, these concepts, I went and, um, I went and, I went and, and tried to think back of my, on my old career. So I was in Buffalo, extrinsically motivated, ups, downs, nervous, you know, one game you play great or, or you play a good game. The next game you make two mistakes. You feel like, you know, you're on the bottom of the world, a bottom feeder. So then you, you bring, get yourself back up. But I won both of those awards in 1990. And I went like, well, and in 1991, I went to the NHL All-Star Game. So at some point, well, is that coincidence? While I was reading myself into it, I went, let's see, you know, there's something to this. Because what does it, did it promote with me? The Most Improved Player Award, that, is, that means 
the, within your team, within your organization, you don't get that from the media. You don't get that from the fans. You get that generally, or in my case, you got it from the team. So that's your coaching staff acknowledging this guy, whatever we have done with him, he's actually gotten better. So my confidence level, my base on which I go to work every single day, got a little bit better. The next thing that happened was I got the most improved player and I got the Unsung Hero Award. So the Unsung Hero Award was another amazingly strong thing for me, aspect for me on which to build. I'm going, all this grunt work, all this crap that I'm doing, blocking shots, killing penalties, shooting pucks off the glass, has nothing to do, by the way, at that point, with anything that I had done in Europe growing up. I thought of myself as hot shit, good one-timer, you know, can skate, you know, this guy plays more offense and defense. No, no, completely had to change my game to win these things, to do this, to win the Unsung Hero Award. So based on those two things, on a little bit of recognition from within my team, and also a belief that, you know, what I'm doing, I'm kind of on the right track here. Um, maybe it's time for me to kind of look at my role within the team. So killing penalties, doing all this job, doing blocking shots, I keep saying this, like really following the coach's advice and, and coaching rules to a T, not to lose my job. I went like, hey, maybe it's time to tap into something else. So in 1990, this is the time where video started getting to be, be a factor in the NHL. We had, you know, the two VCRs and VHS tapes, and they hired a guy, and he's juggling these tapes. I got to, meet, got to be good, really good friends with our video coach. The guy, and this guy would basically just deal with special teams. So I said to him, hey, uh, Fixie, anytime number four steps on the ice, I want you to hit that record button. So he said, uh, all right, cool. I said, I want my home games, I want my tape. Oh, all right, I get my tape after home game, so I go home, game one or lost, whatever it is, I stick that tape into the, in the VCR, sit down in front of the TV. My wife at the time, she loved it, right? Here's the game late at night, and this guy's not coming to bed, he's watching hockey again. Made me real popular, ended up well for me. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, I, <clears throat> so I went and, uh, and watched my 20 minutes. I had 20 minutes of, of ice time, sometimes 23, sometimes 17, whatever it was. But I found myself, right, based with last year's most improved player, based on unsung hero, I watch my, watch my shift. I get the puck always in the same situation. Every single time I'm a right-handed defenseman playing the right side in a small rink in Buffalo, it's tight. I mean, you couldn't, I'm six foot six, I could not stand behind the net without my butt touching the backboard, right? So this was tight, this was close. And any time I tried to do something with the puck, where I went, I'm gonna show them today, I'm a European player, I can dance, right? Backhand pass, something, it would backfire. Boom, that puck would come back in our end. These guys would run us again. Everybody would be screaming, coach would come down on me. And every time I would go, take my three strides, take a little bit of open ice, take one look at my centerman, pass it to the center, pass it to the winger, goes off the glass, goes out. And I would do it every single game. I said, why am I doing something different? Why am I even spending time on trying to create something that's not there? So I changed my game. Changed my game, made it simpler. Didn't spend as much time. Didn't sit in the locker room before the game going, oh my God, the four checkers are coming. I'm going to be on my back end. But maybe if I make this play. No, it was simple. I was starting to be on the right track and I started to take control of my game. So basically what I recognized at that point was I had a really good coaching staff. Great guys. Rick Dudley was the, was the head coach. Craig Ramsey was the assistant coach. Um, John Tortorella came in. Um, and John Van Boxmeer. We had four guys, really strong hockey minds, but you know what? They did not tell me all the things that I needed to know for me, and I needed to learn to be a different player than I was. For me to take the next step, I needed to do that myself. So I had to go and do something that I get a kick out of. So my motivation, whatever was driving me, I was all right. I knew I had a chance to play in the NHL at that point. I was in my second year, my third year. You know, what's going to happen? They don't like me in Buffalo. I, man, I go somewhere else, probably. But I wanted to stay in Buffalo. And I did not like my role anymore. So 
my motivation changed from being completely dependent on what the coach tells me, the praise of the coach, the negative motivation of the coach, potential negative motivation. It changed to, this is what I got to do to get better. And without really knowing it and reading up over the last few weeks and getting into depth on this issue, I was turning into a different type of player. I started getting more intrinsically motivated, changing it, taking control of my career, and not um, being so dependent on my coach's advice. Influencing factors on the way to the good pro. So what I'm trying to, what I, the little story that I told you was also a transformation from being a rookie, a second year player, to a guy that has some standing in the room. So he's played now for two or three years. He's doing a good job. He's a reliable dude, right? I wasn't anything but a reliable player at that point, but I was getting better. This was before All-Star Game. This is on my way to it. And um, there were certain influencing factors on my way to it. And this started for me in Germany. We, uh, you know, you have eight out of 10 players. Again, I'm quoting, again, this is not me doing, this is me doing some research. Eight out of 10 players that are world-class players, high-level performers, regardless of in any sport, athletes, had, as in childhood, had a hero or role model. So that's a very important thing. So if you, for, for kids, for me at the time, it was a guy by the name of Udo Kiesling. Um, he's, uh, he's in the IHF Hall of Fame. He's the, um, you know, probably the German uh, equivalent of what Bobby Orr is to North America. And, uh, you know, he was the guy that I watched and I wanted to be like him. And, uh, hey, I'll take it as far as you look at Udo Kiesling's signature today. His first name starts with a U. My name starts with a U. I remember sitting in, the, in my parents' living room trying to emulate his signature. The U today of Udo Kiesling and my name, Uwe Krupp, or, you know, that's my real name. My, they call me differently. It's the same you. I'm still doing it today. I'm 50-some years old. That you that I had for my role model is still what I'm doing today. Um, important aspect, very positive thing for me. Team identity and tradition, influencing factors. I think it's much easier for a player to develop if he comes into a team that has a really strong identity. And, uh, and tradition plays a role, obviously, but you know, I think if you take those two points, team identity and tradition, and team culture and pride, and you can make two slides of PowerPoint with it, which we do not want to do today because we've had a lot, uh, two long days, but it is one of the key aspects in a young player to come, you learn and you get, uh, you get familiarized with what it's all about, what are the demands, who you want to be, and you've got to figure out your role within that concept. Family values and upbringing, how many players grow up today, and uh, you know, you watch interviews with pro players, they do a little personality profile with them, and you say, who's the most influential guy in your life? Who do you emulate? Who's the, and they go, well, you know, my dad. My dad. And if you, every time you hear that, you go, that seems like a really positive story. That's something that I think every father, I'm a dad, um, that you look for, that your kid at some point looks at you and says, you know, that's a great thing. I want to be like my dad. And the things that he taught me helped me today to be the person that I am. Um, the last aspect here, being asked and opinion valued, that goes back into, into motivation. And I think in any group of people that you work with, um, if... You, when you address them, when you talk to them, when you get to know them, I think the moment you ask them about their opinion, what they, how they feel about it, what they think about a problem for us as coaches, what do you think about that kind of penalty killing? Should we be aggressive there? Should we not? Ask the question and the player's answer. You take it into the process and you use him and you make him uh, feel like he's part of the solution of the problem. Right? That guy is going to be motivated. He's going to be motivated. And if you put all those things together, he's a valued opinion, tradition, pride, culture, identity, good values. You're going to go and you get to, we we're talking about a certain type of player. That player that we're all trying to sign when, we, when they come from North America to Europe, we're looking for the good pro. The good pro, the potential leader, the role model. So you've got this guy. And he's coming in, and he has a few more characteristics that we, go, that we are looking for. I remember when I went to Buffalo and again went to North America, and the coach said to me, 
You know, the, the player has only t one job, and that is to come into training camp in shape, and he's got to be on time. We've heard this now today a number of times. And uh, it's really interesting in different uh, speeches and in different talks, it keeps coming in. Be on time and be in shape. Everything else out of your hands. Everything else is controlled by external factors, whether you, what your role is in the team. Well, I'm going to give you a role in the team. You play a certain way, accordingly, you're going to get a role in the team. Um, whether you play, whether you not play, how good you play, whether the goaltender makes a safe or the puck goes in when you're shooting it, you know, that's not in your control. But those two things are very important. Everything in the interest of team success. Something that sometimes is that's a really it's an ideal everything in the interest of team success is an ideal and if you have a team full of guys that will do this you're going to be successful the reality that i work with and many of you work with is influencing factors we've seen it with alpo alpo brought in all the influencing factors that influence the game the players the characteristics in the game well we're looking for contracts guys that are in negotiations, guys that have already signed Europe, guys that have signed with a different team, complicated, multi-fold aspects that play a role in this. And uh, self-awareness and pride. When you go and talk to a sports psychologist and you say, how do we go and get the guys to be driven and how do we approach them and how do they, when they practice, they go on the ice and they're just... Ah, they're waiting the time, right? They step on the ice, I blow the whistle, they stop in front of me, they nod when I do the drill, they go in position. They do, they can practice like this, or they can practice with self-awareness and pride. Right? And again, I'm being a bit of an idealist, I think we all have to be to a certain degree. If you want a guy, to, a player to develop to his maximum potential, those guys always have a great self-awareness. They're aware of their, of their job, they're aware of their form on that day of their execution, what they're supposed to do. They're really aware, really awake, and when you have guys like that in your team, um, you're going to have some good leadership. Sackic versus Braveheart, or inspired through, uh, through action versus vocally attempting to lead. Um, so all, all this is obviously geared, this, this subject is geared to go and talk in, at some point about leadership in the team. And uh, how do you get there? We are, we're talking about different types of people, how to develop them into leaders. And then you got a group of guys, and all of a sudden you're sitting in the locker room, and your management is talking to you, and we're going, so who's our captain? Uh, I don't know. Well, who's got natural leadership ability? Hmm. This guy, maybe, but he's not a good enough player. Right? You need a good player. I think you need to have a good combination there. Well... Uh, who do we pick? Well, we pick the guy. We need needs to be a German guy. In Germany, needs to be a German guy. We need team identity. The fans need to be there. That's got to be a German guy. Ah, okay. So we get, at some point, we're looking at one of our players, a guy that's got some experience, that's a good player, who has been around in the team, who's had some success with the team, and we say, you're the captain of the team. And that guy goes, all right. Do you want to be captain? Yes. I do. I'm waiting for this all my life. I'm ready to go. Okay. So now, this guy who's been a good player, who's watched other captains, who's been a support player, now goes on and uh, has to lead the team. All good, right? You start the season, everything's going well. Well, lose five games. Lose five games, and all of a sudden, what are we doing? Every coach does. We're kind of looking at our leadership, right? How are the guys responding? How are we practicing? How are we going? So now this German guy or whoever that guy is that we gave that seat to, right? he feels pressure. He's got to lead now. He's got to go and say something in the locker room. Right? He's the guy that I've put the stamp on him and said, when I'm turning my back in the locker room, remember, now the weight falls on your shoulders to go and implement or reinforce the things that we need to do to drag this cart of the crap. So this guy now stands up on the, on the boards and he goes, the game is on the line. It's a 3-3 game. You know, we were up 3-2, now it's 3-3. And he goes, guys, we need to get the puck deep. Get the puck deep. And I'm kind of watching as a coach. I'm going, all right, that's no shit, Sherlock. Good idea, eh? <laughs> so, so he goes back on the ice. He runs in the very next shift. The same guy, 
that said all the right things, did all the right things, gets the blue line, is standing still, tries to dangle the defenseman, turnover, we end up playing 40 seconds in our end, and it's a fire drill out there of, uh, of, of offense against us. So now, what do you do? So that guy, he's obviously not going to feel that good. Do you address it with him? Do you not address it with him? Do you leave him alone? I think at every time, you need a group. If you put it on one guy, it's going to be tough. Unless you have a unique individual, you know, everybody knows Marc Messier. That's a guy that said, I guarantee you a victory in the next game against Vancouver in the Stanley Cup playoffs, and he scores a hat trick and wins. Right? That's unique, right? That's Hollywood. Right? Eric Lindros did the same thing a couple of years later, oh, and he lost. Ooh, that didn't work out so well, huh? Big E. Great players, both of them. Unbelievable leaders, but the one guy gets to be a legacy, whereas the other guy is more of a footnote of maybe what not to do. So you need a group of guys that are going to handle it for you. Don't put it on somebody's shoulders, and uh, unless it's a, a really um, unique individual, uh, it's very tough. I put the Sackick in there. I won two Stanley Cups in very different roles. One of them, I was actually a, a, a part of it, a good part of it, and the other one was a black ace, just being around, hanging in there, meeting the team doctors, and being allowed to be there. And... Um, in both of those teams, one time my captain was Joe Sackick, who is a self-depreciating, uh, humorous guy that goes out and leads by example. The second time I had Steve Eisenman, who doesn't say much at all, but when he says something, the room is dead silence. You can hear a pin drop. And he's got a certain air, air about him where he, has, where he leads that way. And both of those guys, though, they were not big talkers. Not big talkers. They had guys. We had lots of guys in the that talk. Brett Hall would talk all the time. Guys would talk at all the time. But our true leadership group, they would not talk. And uh, it's a great example that in order to be a leader, you don't necessarily have to be vocal. Then lead by example. Have a good group around those guys. Support those guys with a good group of good pros. And uh, you'll be fine. What does it take? Um, we're going back to this personal transformation to maturity. I think a role model, like I said before, is a very important ingredient in a young player's life to form him. I think from the role model, you're going to be intrinsically motivated as a young player. I find it very rare that you have a kid that only plays hockey and develops well because the parents want him to play. That kid's got to want to play. He's got to have a, have a reason to play. He's got to have something. And uh, again, out of my own experience, since you know, I'm standing here and nobody else is going to wrap this thing up here today. Um, 1980, when the US national team uh, had the miracle of Lake Placid, won the gold medal, um, I was 15 years old, almost 15 years old. And uh, I was sitting at my parents, uh, staring at that big box TV that we had, small screen thing, and I was watching the US national team. And I had played hockey in Germany, growing up in Cologne, um, you know, in a, Germany has a long hockey tradition, sort of like, like Austria has, as Alpo mentioned, but not regionally in Cologne. So one hour of practice, 45 minutes of practice, two games on the weekend, that was it. That was it up to that point. Lots of football, lots of soccer, and lots of playing, but, you know, actually on ice, not much. That tournament, 1980, I'm sitting on, the, on that footstool in front of my parents' TV, and I'm watching... I'm watching Mark Johnson and Mark, Mike Ramsey and Jim Craig in the net and Ryan O'Callaghan and you name these guys all the way through and I'm going, my God, I want to be a hockey player. I want to be a hockey player. I don't care what it takes. I'm going to be a hockey player. 15 years old. Well, the problem was I still had to go to school, which was, ended up being a bit of a problem, but I wanted to be a hockey player and I turned into a hockey player. And it was completely intrinsically motivated. Not because my parents drove me or my dad told me, you need to play hockey because it's expensive and I'm investing a lot of money in you. That didn't matter to me. I want to be a hockey player because it was the greatest thing. Those games that the U.S. national team played there were the greatest games I've ever seen on TV and it's the greatest story, one of the greatest stories of all time. So what does it take? Personal transformation, the role model, the intrinsic motivation. Then you're going to step up. You're going to go up into a different level, right? We said today that, um, uh, we, we've heard today in one of the speeches where you're not quite, you're ready for this level. You're a good player here. On the next level, you're not established. So with me, what did that to me? 
well, all that intrinsic, self-motivating, really good feeling, warm fuzzies about myself went downhill. I was living from, you're not going to play, to, you know, great job today. You've done a good job. You didn't mess it up. You went up and down. You played left wing for the Cologne Sharks. And you went up and down. You didn't fall on your butt. And you got the puck deep. Well done, young guy. And that's all I wanted to hear. And so I went to extrinsic motivation. All of a sudden, the next thing is, you get a call from the NHL, get drafted. Didn't know what a draft is by then. You know, I had a guy from an import player explain to me what a draft is. Brought me a piece of the Toronto Star and said, you got drafted by the Buffalo Sabres. I said, drafted? What is a draft? So he explained it to me. A couple of years later, the Buffalo Sabres contacted me, and I went to Buffalo's training camp. But I was, I never got out of that extrinsic motivation. I was living, doing exactly what my coach wanted me to do, kind of got my mojo, ended up playing, got a sniff on the German national team, but it's still, my motivation wasn't that I wanted to be this great player. My motivation was, man, I want to keep playing hockey, and I'm going to do anything that I need to do to keep playing. Extrinsic motivation all the way into Buffalo until I get to meet my video guy and I'm going right through. Turns into intrinsic motivation and had that until the end of my career. Eventually you run out of time, right? You get too old, too broken down and you run out of time. But you get, end up being a pretty good player because um, you know, you've gotten some personal um, transformation. I found, this, I found this quote here, and I've had this for a long time in my, when, I was, when I talked to young players. Never let a teacher decide how much you learn, and never allow a coach to determine how good of a player you'll become. I think this kind of puts it all in, into one context. It's, a, it's take control of your career, it's, and tell your players that it's okay to do that. Guide them, help them out, and uh, you will become a leader, and you become, become a pretty good player. Final thoughts. I'm mean, not even sure what the time is. Can you tell, show me that time again? Excellent. Um, final thoughts. Al Arbor. Over the course of my career, I've had a lot of coaches. I had NHL coaching carousel turns kind of like it does everywhere else in the world. And um, <clears throat> I mentioned Rick Dudley. He's, uh, you know, he was the guy that pushed all the right buttons with me. Um, great guy. Kind of you know, took me under his wing a little bit. And uh, he treated me um, not just as a defenseman number four or five, which I was on that team, but uh, really as somebody that felt he had a value to the team, and it, he made me play really well. I got traded to the New York Islanders, and the, my coach there was Al Arbor. Um, for anybody, just quickly, Al Arbor, he won four Stanley Cups with the New York Islanders. He's a coaching legend. I think he's on the number two of all-time wins list uh, of NHL coaches. Is a, an amazing guy. And um, he, you know, unique guy. He had a, you know, not a great X's and O guy. If I had to, I had to go with Al, he was good with X's and O's. He told us kind of what we needed to hear, but he was all personality. He had a booming voice, and, uh, you know, when he stood in front of the team, the guys loved him. He was a, he was a great guy. But I, it took me, when I got traded, why, did everybody, why does everybody love this guy? I talked to Clark Gillies, who I played with, the, with the, in Buffalo. He got traded towards the end of his career to, um, to Buffalo, and Clark says, I'd kill for that guy. Eric, uh, Bob Nystrom said to me, you're going to love him when you meet him. Um, Brian Trotje, all those guys that played for him, Billy Smith, they said, well, Al Arbor, he's the, he's the greatest guy of all time. So what made Al Arbor to be so popular? Was he soft? Oh, no. Al was a hard ass. He let us have it. He was tough. He skated us. He got on us when we didn't play well. But I figured out after a couple of months of being in New York, we didn't have a great team. Just a... Uh, you know, hardworking, not really so much high end. We lived off cohesiveness, and we had to go and go at it. And um, a classic example, um, you know, you play in a tight game. I remember we were playing against Montreal, um, Islanders against Montreal. I come around the net, third period, the game is, um, you know, 3-3, three, 2-2, three, two, two, don't remember exactly. Come in, and I'm thinking, I'm going to make this pass, rink-wide pass, Made in Germany, can't go wrong, right? Uh, that, didn't, that didn't work. That's Stefan Rishi, not the one that's working with me, the good one. He went <laughs> and uh, he came, he read that like a book, took that puck, and this wasn't like, ooh, little mistake, defenseman from the net. No, no, I was coming, big vehicle, right? 747 turning behind the net, scaling up the ice, all my forwards in the neutral zone, I'm doing cross ice pass, and Stefan goes, oh, nice picks up that puck right from center ice, and he goes, buries it under the bar, right? Oof. 
You know, this is five years in an agile career. That still knocks the wind out of you. That still takes your legs and gives you a really good chop. So you just kind of go, ooh, I want to just not be here right now. So back to the bench, you know, the, the, the obligation will tap from the other teammates, you know, come, you know, going, wow. I'm going home after that. I'm going at night, you know, I got to do my thing. Big vehicle, always broken. So ice bags, takes me forever to get out of that locker room. It's dark. Time we go, I'm walking out, walking on the parking lot, walking with my car going, man, I suck, right? This was bad. And guess who's coming towards me? Big L is coming towards me. Pitch black. I'm going, oh, man, that's not happening. So he's walking towards me, and he's tough, right? Respect. I've been there now for five, six weeks, and Al's shown signs of why he was, you know, who he was, and he was big personality. And he goes, he looks at me, he goes, Cooper, what are you doing still? What are you still doing here? I'm like, well, Al, you know, big vehicle needs lots of maintenance. Hey, eh? trying to be humorous. He goes, uh, how are you feeling? I go, oh, not very good right now. He goes, looks at me. He goes, Krupper, come on, go home, glass of red wine, tomorrow's a day off, one practice, and then we'll beat the shit out of Boston. <laughs> and you know what? I went, went back. I looked at him, and I've experienced other things, like so many of us have experienced other situations. I went, I sat in my car, and I was thinking, and you know, and if this guy wants me to go and Fight Cam Neely and Sweeney and Willie Plett and everybody. I'll do it without even asking a question. I'll do every job that this guy would ever ask me to do. And he did it by just following a simple thing. And when I was a, as a coach now, I work very hard on emulating that and taking that lesson. He separated who the player Yui Krupp was and who this guy Yui Krupp was. And he never let that line be blurred. He came in blustery. But when he would see you in the restaurant when we were on the road the night before a game, he'd come over. We just lost three in a row. We just got our butts kicked right and left badly. And he'd come over, walk over with a beer, see us sitting on the table. He's the only coach I've ever had that did this. And he would come and sit with the players. He'd sit there and tell us stories about when he played. He's the guy with the black rimmers. He had the big glasses in the 50s. And tell us a story when he played. And it didn't matter what the season was, where the standings were. At that moment, he was a guy that's just working with a bunch of hockey players. And he had us. He had us so wrapped up. Guys, we went that year. We ended up beating Pittsburgh with this... This awesome team with Jager and Lemieux and Barrasso and Coffey and Scotty Bowman behind the bench and you name it. This unbelievable team. And we beat him in the semifinals, uh, to, uh, in the conference finals to, mo to move on. And of course, eventually we lost in the semis. But it's a you know, great story by, that was created by this amazing person who let the players be the player and the people be the people. And... Um, it's um, you know, definitely uh, left a mark with me and uh, something I will never forget. Um, last thing here. I've heard uh, uh, one of the other presenters put a, put a quote in from Lou Holtz, and I, I really like this. I saw it on the wall in some locker room in Germany here. Ability is what you're capable of doing. Motivation determines how, what you do, and attitude determines how well you do it. And I think that sentence kind of sums up a lot of the things that we look for in our leadership group. Um, I think we, our job as coaches is to inspire as much as we can within the framework of our, of our jobs, what is allowed for us to do, and what we need to, need to work with. And um, from there, it's uh, you know, pick good people and uh, help them to grow. Help them to grow, and they'll never finish when you treat them well. Um, it's kind of a wrap for me. Um, I want to thank everybody here. Again, amazing, uh, amazing two days. Thank you very much. For everybody to show up here again, as the room is still full. Melanie already said, normally they don't show up after lunch. Um, thank you very much for being here, and uh, I guess uh, Carl is going to run some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Uwe. Are there any questions with, for Coach K? It is. Rico, careful what you ask. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> be careful. This has been taped and it's going to be published, right? So, <laughs> just clean, clean. Fun, anyway. oh, great job. Great thanks, job. thanks, thanks. Uh, just when you scored that winning goal in the Stanley Cup in overtime, was it a wrist shot or a slap shot, or were you just trying to get it to the net? No, I actually. <laughs> let me wind up on that, right? Because, no, really, uh, that was obviously an amazing thing for me. You know, first probably, and you know, without any argument, the highlight of my entire hockey life. But when I think back of it, you know, we were so tired. Rico, it was the overwhelming feeling was how tired we were in that game. It was warm in Florida. And, um, and you know, when, again, this is all with distance, right? As a coach, you go back and you think back of this thing. Oh, and Michael Jordan gets asked, and he says, in that particular moment, I'm not comparing myself to Michael Jordan. I just want to make that clear. But he said, <laughs> when, he, when he had to throw this, pa, this ball at the buzzer, winning ball, he says, it felt like I had a lot of time, huge amount of time. It was the time stood still, I was just there. And um, to be completely honest, when I got that puck, it was a bit of a pizza that Terry Kartner threw out, out of the neutral zone, out of the defensive zone, threw it to me on the blue line. Right? When you see the live play, I take it, I wind up, and I, sh I shoot the puck. Right? And when it actually happened, I felt like I got the puck, and I could have looked at it, kicked it with my foot, laid it around, pushed it forward, stepped into it, look, give it another look, and then shoot it. That's how much time it felt I had. And Rico, to answer your question, it was a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, you provided motivation for me because I wasn't coaching then. And then when you scored that goal, I thought, this guy's motivating me. I'm going to go to Germany and coach against him someday. Look at you now. <laughs> Look at you now. You never know where life takes you, eh, Rico?